It's my pleasure tonight to, uh, to be here to present to you uh, Dr. Annette Snap, who's with the Seminole Tribe. Dr. Snap earned her master's degree in applied anthropology with a concentration in public archaeology from the University of South Florida, so a Floridian trained archaeologist, as well as a master's of studies and PhD in ethnology and museum ethnography from the University of Oxford. So she went a bit overseas on us uh, and had, a, I understand, a very good time there. Uh, she served as a professional archaeologist for over 20 years in Florida and the southeastern United States and is also certified by the Register of Professional Archaeologists. In 2009 and 2011, Dr. Snap co-directed the Archaeological Field School at Florida Gulf Coast University in conjunction with Dr. Paul Backhouse of the Seminole Tribe of Florida, who is the Tribal Preservation Officer for the tribe. Since 2013, she has served as the, she threw in an abbreviation here without a spelling, the Operations manager. Oh, with the Seminole tribe. Okay, yes. And uh, we are honored tonight to have her give her talk, Everything You Know is Wrong, which many people have said to me <laughs> over the course of my lifetime, uh, particularly my wife. Uh, community archaeology at Fort Shackelford. So I think I'm looking forward to this. I think we'll get to know more about uh, not, over, not only Florida history, but Seminole Native American history as well. So please welcome Dr. Snap. Um, I just want to uh, put in a pitch for Florida Archaeology Month. Um, it's March of every year, so here we are, 2015, Archaeology Month, Florida Archaeology Month is here. And one of the reasons that archaeologists try and reach out to the public um, during this month and throughout the year is if we don't share uh, uh, our enthusiasm, passion, knowledge, and what we gain from doing archaeology, uh, we may not have things to work on in the future, right? We have to make our pitch now <laughs> and, to, and, and help people understand our perspective that archaeology is important, we don't want to destroy sites, um, we want to study them. So that's part of what Florida Archaeology Month is about. So I'm, I'm really thrilled to be here again to see you. I think I uh, spoke last to this group three years ago. I did talk about uh, Fort Shackelford, and I'm going to go a little bit deeper into the Fort Shackelford story. These are the seminal reservations that are scattered throughout the state of Florida. So you can see there's, there's one in Tampa, it's very small. Uh, Fort Pierce, another small one. You can see Brighton, it's larger. You might be able to see that from your seat. That is at the northwest edge of Lake Okeechobee. Another small one here at Immokalee. Um, here, Hollywood is where Seminole Tribe of Florida has their headquarters, but it's here at the Big Cypress Seminole Indian Reservation that um, the heart of, of the tribe is. It's where the Seminoles last held out the Third Seminole War. Uh, they hid here in this area while the federal troops were looking for them. Uh, it was at the edge of the Everglades, which are over here, and also at the north edge of uh, the Big Cypress Swamp here. It was very difficult to get to. A couple of hundred Seminoles refused to leave. They refused to be removed and taken out west to Indian lands and instead stayed here. Uh, the United States decided to end the war. Uh, there was no treaty ever signed, so they are known as the unconquered, and this is why. A couple of hundred Seminoles stayed here in this area, uh, and the tribe today uh, is a result of those descendants of those people who held out. So. Um, our Atathiki Museum, which means a place to learn, a place to remember, is actually located here on the Big Cypress Seminole Indian Reservation. Uh, so let's just give you a, a quick background. And um, also to tell you quickly why we're located there, um, I hope everybody got a, got a, a pamphlet. Um, we're located there because that is a part of the story. That's where those last remnants stayed and held out. So it's more important for the Seminole to tell their, that story in that location rather than in Hollywood or Tampa where they might have more visitation, but instead bring you out to them 
to experience that environment, to travel through that environment and sort of be transported as you go almost back in time because it, there's not much as far as development is concerned um, around uh, this, this area. Uh, we have people driving in, most of us are driving in from the west coast or the east coast and no matter which way you drive in, you're seeing alligators, you're seeing lots of wildlife, bears, sometimes deer beside the road, uh, you know, the, the, the wildlife, it's incredible. Um, so we sort of consider it part of that experience and part of immersing yourself as you go deeper and deeper into the center part of Florida, of South Florida. Third Seminole War era, Fort Shackelford, shown there on the map, was built, abandoned, and burned in 1855. 154 years later in 2009, the exact location of this fort became the subject of an archeological field school. Given the amount of time that had passed and the brevity of the fort's short life, we expected confirming the fort's location might be challenging, and, but we did not know when we began how critical seminal tribal input would be to understanding our results. One historic account of a past event on the Big Cypress Seminole Indian Reservation is important for setting the backdrop for the Archaeological Field School. The story serves as a cautionary tale <clears throat> for the Seminole tribe about revealing important cultural information to outsiders. This account by Josie Billy in 1963, um, this account, this cautionary tale told by Josie Billy has served the community for decades <clears throat> and directly involves Fort Shackelford the subject of the 2009 Archaeological Field School. <coughs> Through time, in our efforts to interpret the results of the field school investigations, we found ourselves repeatedly coming back to this story and the result of its influence over the years. The cautionary tale. This gentleman, uh, Josie Billy, we will talk more about him. He was an important figure in the Seminole tribe. Uh, during his lifetime, he served as a doctor, a member of council, a medicine man, a, and a Christian minister. Uh, William Strait, in an article summarizing the accomplishments of Josie Billy, noted that throughout the years, Josie has been an innovator, innovator who early recognized that the Seminole could not continue to live in isolation. He has attempted to bring to his people the best of the white man's way of life while retaining the best of the Indians' culture. It's worth noting that Josie Billy's father, Little Billy, also known as Little, Little Billy Fuel and Billy Conapache, was the first seminal person to attend a white school, which he did for three years. And doing this was a huge breach um, to the seminal culture. His actions were considered a severe breach and only due to the interve intervention of his father's family members did he escape severe punishment, and that was for going and learning at a white school. Perhaps as a result of his father's interest in education with the white settlers, Josie Billy may have been more trusting of uh, outsiders uh, than other tribal members. But the following incident taught him a lesson about that trust and his culture. In 1964 or 1965, Josie Billy told of his own personal mishap with outsiders in an event involving the location of Fort Shackelford. He explained, and explained this to other tribal members, that after burning Fort Shackelford in 1855, fighting a battle and running off soldiers, the Seminole discovered inside the fort at the captain's quarters gold coinage, perhaps $20 gold pieces that was used to pay the soldiers. Since the battle resulted in the death of soldiers and the Seminole do not take from the dead, they decided the best approach was to bury the gold coins and not tell anyone. Then, in the mid to late 1930s, after studying military archives, professional archaeologists from either the University of Miami or the University of Florida, and really the university doesn't matter, but consider it an academic archaeologist, approached Josie Billy, this gentleman, about the location of Fort Shackelford. And they asked Josie Billy to show them the location of the fort and they assured him that they would not take anything from the location without his approval. He felt comfortable with these assurances and showed them the location of where the fort once stood. The archeologist then took back him back to his home and thanked him, telling him 
that they were leaving. <clears throat> the next morning, Josie Billy awoke feeling really badly about what had happened. He became suspicious. He returned to the fort location <clears throat> that he had shared with the archaeologist just the day before and found that he had been deceived. Instead of leaving, as they had told Josie Billy, the archaeologist had circled back to the site and dug at the spot Josie Billy identified as the fort's location. Upon arriving at the fort site, he discovered a tripod with a hoist and tackle block left behind by the archaeologist, thought to have been used to remove the chest of gold buried by the Seminole earlier. He realized it had been a mistake to tell the archaeologist where the site actually was located. The deceit was never forgotten, and Josie Billy warned the Seminole community to be wary of outsiders, <coughs> a warning that has never been forgotten. And, and this is a story that was told to me by uh, councilman Mondo Tiger, Manuel Tiger, who he's the councilman for Big Cypress. So he heard Josie Billy tell the story to him and other tribal members. Um, and keep in mind that this is uh, a culture that oral tradition is how they hand this information down from generation to generation. So things aren't written down, but these stories are told and it's, the information is passed along. Using his own unfortunate experience with the site of Fort Shackelford as an example of what can happen, Josie Billy urged the community not to reveal important cultural information with outsiders because they are liable to take it away. This message resonated with the councilman <clears throat> later when he remembered Josie Billy's prediction that one day the tribe would not exist. When he first heard this message, he believed that it was about extin extinction of tribal people. <clears throat> but today, he sees the message as a warning about the loss of culture leading to the loss of the tribe. So it isn't necessarily the loss of the people, but the, the losing the culture. In this light, the protection of cultural resources is vital to survival of the tribe. And protecting the location of Fort Shackelford then is a component of cultural preservation. And um, part of what I'm going to be um, sharing tonight is you know, our journey through understanding. You know, we, we heard about this story after the field school. So we had a better, better understanding of whether tribal people were willing uh, to share information with a certain or not about Fort Shackelford and its actual location. And when you understand the importance of it, um, it, it to them as part of their culture and part of who they are, and uh, uh, it, it's, it's very revealing. So Josie Billy's cautionary tale is one that promotes a wariness of outsiders. In uh, 2009, we initiated an archaeological field school project to determine the accuracy of a concrete marker. And this is marking Fort Shackelford. This is in 1895. Remember I told you it was burned in 1855. It was, it was built, abandoned, and burned all in the same year. Uh, but it keeps showing up on military maps which was also a curious thing to us to see that the memory of that location is important. It was important to these map makers to keep calling it out year after year, 40 years later. It's gone. It's been gone for 40 years, and yet we keep seeing them on the maps. So um, we were working at the location. There's the, that's the concrete marker uh, that, that actually marks a location that we believe uh, is Fort Shackelford. We wondered if this was accurate. We'll learn more about this concrete marker later. It was put in in the 30s. But as we worked to determine the accuracy of this, we were unaware of the oral history that I just told you and of the events that had transpired at the very spot we hoped to relocate. So we forged ahead. <laughs> The Seminole Tribal Historic Preservation Office collaborated with Florida Gulf Coast University on an archaeological field school. Students from FGCU traveled uh, to and stayed on Big, Big Cypress Seminole Indian Reservation to learn and practice archaeological investigative techniques. That shows the students out in the field. And um, I think you might, some of you might be able to see the concrete marker here. You can see it is a, a pretty significant size. This provided an opportunity to explore the heritage and memory of Fort Shackelford for its historical context as well as its relevance to the modern uh, lives of the tribal and non-tribal residents of South Florida. Practically, the project offered a unique opportunity for the involvement of members of the tribal community, 
the Seminole Tribe of Florida's Tribal Historic Preser Preservation Office and Florida Gulf Coast University in the investigation of a historically contested site within the heart of the Big Cypress Seminole Indian Reservation. The relocation of what are often ephemeral Seminole War era military installations is a notoriously difficult archaeological proposition. This Fort Shackleford was not there for very long. It was not occupied for very long. <laughs> the main question for the field work was to test the validity of an extant concrete marker. And I apologize, I got the date wrong. It was actually placed there in 1941 under the direction of D. Graham Copeland. There's a, a closer shot of, uh, this is actually the tent that we used uh, to keep our equipment in, uh, keep it dry, um, <coughs> and this is the concrete marker. On top of it is a brass disc that indicates this is the site of Fort Shackelford. It says in Second and Third Seminole Wars, but it was really Third Seminole War era. Copeland was interested in, in marking these important military uh, um, locations from the, the, the Seminole Wars. So he did this throughout South Florida. This is just one of many that he marked. He was a surveyor for Collier County and architect for the Tamiami Trail. Uh, the marker which stands today is in an open pasture, which you could see. <clears throat> um, and as I pointed out, it's capped off with this brass disc. There are no above ground features that remain visible to suggest that this was the lo location of the fort and the past year has clearly been heavily modified by agricultural practices. A secondary research goal was uh, therefore to determine the integrity and spatial extent of any culturally significant deposits recorded at this location. Copeland's marker is a fixed point in the landscape and was expected to require a limited amount of excavation work to confirm or not its accuracy in marking the site of Fort Shackelford. So this target was ideal for an archeological field school and it became the starting point of a journey. And this passage would eventually show us that locating an old fort can be difficult for many reasons, and that some of these reasons may be the result of community actions to preserve precious cultural resources and really keep them from prying eyes. Um, the history and ethnogenesis of the people today identified as the Seminole Tribe of Florida is socially politically and geographically complex. <clears throat> Continued pressure from colonial expansion in the southeastern U.S. Dis dis destabilized and displaced indigenous groups, pushing them unceasingly, unceasingly toward the periphery of habitable land. By the end of the Second Seminole War in 1842, the Seminole were living <coughs> within the interior of South Florida. It was not long, however, before the 1850 Swamp and Overflowed Land Act granted federal swamp lands to the states, catalyzing an interest in Seminole reservation lands. Land speculation, in tandem with the fear of Seminole guerrilla attacks on settlers, led to a renewed effort to remove the Seminole further into the Everglades and ultimately force the removal to Western Indian lands. I'm already starting to set the stage here of what was happening um, with the Seminole Wars. Um, how many people recognize this gentleman? Andy. Andy. All right, now, there were certain people who knew this man, uh, Andrew Jackson, as Old Hickory. Who do you think those folks were? Tennesseans. Tennesseans, absolutely. Colonial people, right? This is how the uh, Native Americans knew him, a sharp knife. Okay, so it's different perspectives on the same man. You know, and he uh, was the, you know, the lead person for the Indian Removal Act of 1830, which of course led to the Trail of Tears and, you know, further pushing of, uh, uh, you know, it's like g g giving the green light to removing Native Americans from their homelands, displacing them out west uh, to Indian lands that had been reserved for them. This is just a, um, uh, shows the Florida Everglades and Uncle Sam saying, you may have these if you drain and develop them. And this is Miss Florida in, uh, in the boat next to him. So the Swampland Act of 1850 put pressure, uh, you know, added pressure on, on the Seminoles because the, the uh, pioneers who were here, uh, you know, started eyeing other lands. Now, this is not uh, a drawing of Fort Shackelford, but it is one of Fort Simon Drum, and we believe they probably looked very similar. 
Uh, Fort Shackelford was but one of a group of federal forts built on dry patches of land at the western edge of the Everglades. These forts were intended to exert pressure on the Seminole in an effort to encourage immigration to Indian lands west of the Mississippi, modern day Oklahoma. Fort Shackelford was a US military outpost constructed on Seminole Indian reservation lands on the cusp of the Third Seminole War in early 1855 and its location proved to be a U.S. military invasion of the land set aside for the Seminole after the Second Seminole War. By December of 1855, the fort was burnt down and it was never rebuilt. Instead, what, instead what remained of the fort melted into the watery landscape. Now, the story that is connected to the, the beginning of the Third Seminole War, you have surveyors that are coming out uh, onto Seminole Reservation lands. They're surveying, they're building forts, okay. Um, here it shows Fort Shackelford's built. It's constructed in February of 1855. In June of 1855, it's abandoned. Does anybody know why it would be abandoned? They're done with the survey? <laughs> no, no, but it, that's a good guess. It, it was flooded. It was flooded, so they marched back to Fort Myers. And Fort Myers was a big hub during the Third Seminole War for people. So people were always marching back and forth to Fort Myers. So they marched back to Fort Myers in June. And in December of 1855, they go out. They discover that it's burned down. And uh, this gentleman, uh, Billy Bowlegs, uh, the story is that the surveyors, as they were leaving, they ran across Billy Bowlegs' camp. His camp was there. He had uh, banana trees, maybe other things, because of course they would have had gardens. So, you know, the Seminoles had gardens probably in many locations, and that they destroyed his, they intentionally destroyed his uh, banana plants, and uh, the story, that's how the story goes, and then uh, uh, it, he finds out about it, Billy Bull Bullegs finds out about it, and uh, gets a group of folks together, and they attack the surveyors as they're kind of heading back to Fort Myers, which is, you know, it's all related to this. Uh, you know, the beginning of the Third Seminole War. But keep in mind that the, the Seminole are not thinking of it like this. This is just one long protracted horrible thing for them that starts early in the 1800s, right? And it doesn't end until uh, the end of the Third Seminole War in 1858, all right? So these are just hostilities that have continued to go on for them. And um, so we see this as an, an important um, event uh, that probably was a catalyst um, and you know knowing that this location is uh, there on uh, Big Cypress Seminole Indian Reservation is of, of importance to the Seminole as well and they know this story and uh, they share the, their stories about these events and wh what transpired. All right um, so Shackelford's um, right at the edge of the Everglades <clears throat> um, they're, they're pushing, they're invading. Um, so what do we know of the fort from historic documents? Because we do have some military documents associated with it. Um, activities associated with the building uh, began 1855 um, in February, as I said. Um, and that's when they decided the location. Uh, they... Um, uh, they went to Waxy Hadjo's Landing, which is nearby. That's where they staged all the materials that they needed to build uh, the blockhouse. Um, they constructed the blockhouse, and then, uh, as I said, shortly thereafter, it was flooded, and uh, they left. But in, they also, we, we say Fort Shackelford, who is this named after? We all want to know that. And we don't know for certain, but there was a, a fellow soldier that was in the same um, artillery group is this, that a gentleman who, uh, his name was Musco Livingston Shackelford, and uh, as I said, he came with the same group that built Fort Shackelford, and after graduating from West Point in 1832, he fought in the Second Seminole War, and he was present at the Battle of uh, Wahoo Swamp in uh, 1836. He then went to serve in the Mexican-American War, and that is where he's mortally wounded. So he is wounded and dies in Mexico in 1847 before the Third Seminole War. So naming forts after fallen comrades, something that was pretty common during the Seminole Wars. So we think that's the gentleman who it's named after 
is uh, Musco Livingston Shackelford. Um, as far as the fort's appearance, the Third Seminole War forts were typically not substantial structures and for the most part comprised only a single block house and several ancillary thatched huts. Few documents contain any descriptive information on the location or structures that comprise Fort Shackelford. In a letter dated July 1st, 1855, Brevet Colonel Monroe reports that Captain Elsie of the 2nd Artillery near Waxy Hadjo's Landing Quote, having selected the most eligible position for a blockhouse in that vicinity, he commenced its erection on the 27th of February. The point selected is the most southern near the Everglades that is practicable for wagons to reach. In addition, um, Ives also stated that the blockhouse is situated upon a pine island one mile from Waxy Hadjo's Landing, near the edge of the Everglades and just within the swamp. We have descriptions like this that make it really difficult to, to pinpoint exactly. Um, we w did uh, some work in 2011 at a location that we believed was Waxy Hadjo's Landing and only to discover that there are different locations that are called Waxy Hadjo's Landing. <laughs> it's just very, very, very hard to nail down exactly where these things were. Uh, Fort Shackelford then was a block house, possibly with picketing, like shown here with, at Fort Simon Drum. Uh, contemporary hand-drawn maps of Fort Deneau uh, indicate around 10 smaller structures in addition to the main blockhouse with no evidence for picketing at this location. So again, it's hard to know. Uh, it would be important for an archaeologist to know if there was picketing because that would help us find it in the field, right? Um, all right. We believe that um, pine was probably used to construct it due to the uniformity of the wood. However, in a description of Fort Simon Drum, drawn here, cypress was used for the fortification. At the location of Fort Shackelford, both types of wood were available and could have been used. <clears throat> An April 20th, 1855 letter from Lieutenant and Acting Assistant Adjutant General Thomas J. Haynes to Captain Bennett H. Hill states that the men stationed at the fort were, quote, soon to be withdrawn, unquote, for the summer wet season, and that any company being sent across the region should be equipped with adequate, adequate provisions for the return to Fort Dallas, which is modern day Miami. By June, the soldiers at Shackelford had abandoned the blockhouse due to flooding. Uh, and that was typical uh, during, during the wars to have most of your activity during the dry season, which uh, here in Florida is the winter season. Later that year on December 7th is when Hartsif, Lieutenant George L. Hartsif in command of an exploring party headed toward the Big Cypress to survey the area found that Fort Shackelford had been burned. Uh, whilst returning from Big Cypress, the party was ambushed by Seminoles near Billy Bolick's camp on the 20th of December. And as I said, that's an in incident that marks the beginning of the Third Seminole War. The site location, construction, and naming of this military outpost is only the beginning of this fort's long journey through time. This is just give you another uh, view here again of the Big Cypress Reservation, which is where this concrete marker for Fort Shackelford is. By the end of the Third Seminole War, in 1858, a few hundred Seminole remained in their South Florida home. That's in this Big Cypress area, despite efforts by the federal government to force them to move to Indian lands out west. Those who stayed in their Florida homeland entered a period of very limited contact with outsiders. Until the late 19th and early 20th century, the Seminole people restricted any regular interactions with others to traders at trading posts and few others. By 1899, the main parcels of the Big Cypress Seminole Indian Reservation totaling 14,000 acres had been set aside for the Seminole Indians. The Big Cypress Reservation included the location of Fort Shackelford. Unfortunately, the burning of Fort Shackelford soon after it was built uh, left little for people coming later to find in the landscape of its existence. Um, nonetheless, it was, as I said, in the 1940s, D. Graham Copeland sought to mark the location of Fort Shackelford and other locations associated with the Seminole Wars. Uh, he did this uh, by using military maps. This started being drawn in the year 1839. He used these maps not only to record the trails and routes of the Second and Third Seminole Wars used by the US Army, but also used letters, archives, and interviews of the old, older pioneers in the area, including many of the Seminole leaders. 
By this time, nearly 90 years had passed since the burning of Fort Shackelford, and this military installation had already garnered a reputation for being elusive. A close examination of Copeland's efforts to mark the location of Fort Shackelford introduces, introduces more questions than answers. So this is the marker that, we're, that we were investigating. Despite the careful records kept by Copeland, the placement of this concrete marker for Fort Shackelford remains today somewhat shrouded in mystery. We discovered this recently when we, be we became aware of a letter, letter written by Copeland to Mr. W. Stanley Hansen that adds more fog to the Shackelford location mystery. The Hansen collection contains a letter dated June 19, 1941 from D. Graham Copeland to Mr. W. Stanley Hansen, who was a Fort Myers tax collector and Lee County Commissioner who advocated for the Seminole people and was known as the White Medicine Man. In the letter, Copeland states that, quote, we headed for the Indian Reservation where we hope to see you and get you to point out to us the location of old Fort Shackelford so that it could, could be monumented. Unfortunately, we did not get there. I gave Mr. Fair a concrete monument and a specially prepared brass circle giving the details to be mounted on top of the monument on the site of the old fort. I will greatly appreciate you and Mr. Fair and your associates planting this monument on the site of old Sh Fort Shackelford as soon as it can be conveniently done. When the museum has been planted, will you kindly refer it by bearing in distance to the nearest government section corner and advise me to these data so I may have a record thereof. Clearly, Copeland did not personally set the concrete marker with a brass disc atop the site of Fort Shackelford. Instead, he entrusted the positioning of the marker to Mr. W. Stanley Hansen and Mr. Fair, who presumably, presumably did so later in response to Copeland's request. But the question of whether or not the correct site was originally marked is raised by Copeland himself, who writes later in the same letter to Hansen, Sam Thompson also told me yesterday that the site of Old Fort Shackelford was outside of the original Indian Reservation. This is extremely at variance with all previous information I have been able to gather on the subject. Will you kindly check this and advise me as to your findings? I feel sure that you will know definitely the location of Old Fort Shackelford. <laughs> Was Sam Thompson's memory faulty reg regarding another location for the fort? And did W. Stanley Hansen, quote, know definitely the location of Fort Shackelford? Our initial efforts <clears throat> followed a traditional archaeological field school trajectory of b background research prior to field work. We knew a little bit about the environment, the types of fortifications typically constructed in South Florida during this conflict and about the soldier for whom the fort was named. We also discovered that Copeland did not personally place the concrete marker for Fort Shackelford. He appears instead to have directed its placement by someone he thought would know its location. And the archeologist who had deceived Josie Billy had come and gone by 1941 when the concrete marker was positioned to mark the location of Fort Shackelford. In the background, Josie Billy's cautionary tale played on. There we go, okay. Current residents, <laughs> what do we know of the environment? Um, this historical context provided us with a backdrop for the events that transpired during the Seminole Wars, as well as Copeland's effort to mark the fort's location in 1941. We utilized additional traditional archeological lines of evidence to add depth to our understanding of this location. The concrete marker placed under the direction of Copeland in 1941 is in an area of low topographic relief as compared to the slightly higher landforms located to the north and west. As characterized by low flat topography, the general soils consist of sand, limestone, and organic deposits supporting a myriad of features such as wet, wet prairies, cypress heads, hammocks, etc. During six months of the year, the water table is within 30 centimeters of the surface, which we discovered quickly during the field school. And um, the, the depth to the bedrock is also shallow. Today, the area is a pasture land that's been transformed for agricultural use by clearing the, manual, the natural vegetation, leveling the land surface, and excavating a series of drainage ditches. Directly to the west of the suspected Fort Shackleford site is a wetland which is typical for marshes found at the edge of the Everglades. 
This area is ponded six to nine months of the year and supports both cypress and pond apple. One of the most influential factors in this ecosystem is the seasonal changes in precipitation with a pronounced wet season during the summer months when flooding often occurs. We also disco discovered that during the field school when the <laughs> thunder clouds started rolling in in the afternoons and I would try to keep everybody's <laughs> Uh, spirits up by saying this is what the soldiers were encountering and that's why they left. <laughs> so standing water can be expected during the rainy season. season. Numerous, numerous early narratives describe the difficulty of traversing the southern Florida landscape. For instance, the military road leading for, from Fort Simon Drum, which is the nearest to Fort Shackelford, quote, can be traversed by wagons as far as Fort Shackelford during the dry season, places being occasionally met with that are boggy and somewhat difficult to cross. Oak and Pine Islands are seen about six miles to the north of the road, often appearing in the distance like an unbroken line of forest. Because of these environmental conditions, U.S. military strategy had to address the seasonal difficulties associated with operating a field campaign in a landscape that, for six months, uh, six months of the year, was inundated. Um, one letter from 1855, July of 1855, so this is when it's flooded, uh, written by um, Brevet Colonel John Monroe to Colonel Samuel Cooper and Colonel Lorenzo Thomas. Uh, Monroe writes, Sir, as the season for active operations in this peninsula have closed, has closed and the troops have been withdrawn from the field, suggesting s seasonal military operations. So the, the military operations were really uh, uh, limited to, to the dry season, as I mentioned before. Uh, in the same letter, Monroe reports that Fort Thompson, uh, which is uh, along uh, the Caloosahatchee River, was abandoned in favor of Fort Deneau, <coughs> as it was less likely to flood. Um, in an overview of the landscape, he writes, the country examined south of the Caloosahatchee, so reported as entirely worthless for agricultural purposes, with the exception of a few small scattered hammocks, and in the summer season, nearly the whole of it is underwater. It's important to underscore this implication as counterintuitive to our modern heritage management concepts, which tend to focus on the permanence of important places. Military installations, such as Fort Shackelford, were probably always intended then to be temporary. Minimal investment and seasonal occupation of forts was normal practice for a conflict which had shifted geographic focus for more than half a century. All right, uh, preliminary research. For the, oh, here we go. All right, let's get into the heart of some of this. Uh, preliminary efforts to understand the project area <clears throat> provided a good foundation for moving forward and all results appear to support the accuracy of the concrete marker. For example, GIS research showed that the proposed location of Fort Shackelford was probably in the general vicinity of the, the Copeland marker, although thought to be up to 250 meters to the west. Examination of early aerials of the area shows that between 1940 and the late 1960s, the project area shows massive changes to the landscape. An east-west canal was constructed south of the concrete marker with drainage ditches cross excuse me, crisscrossing the pastures. Push-up piles were also present in the 1960s as the result of the land clearing process and can be seen in the vicinity of the concrete marker. Ground penetrating radar, some of you may be familiar with that. That's this equipment right here, uh, was used. It was conducted over 13,750 square meters with 10,000 square meters centered on Copeland's concrete marker. So they worked all around that concrete marker. No distinct linear features were noted in the resultant GPR renders. However, a very interesting circular feature was noted to the southeast of Copeland's marker. Ground ins inspection gave few clues as to whether the cause was uh, plant growth, a raised surface, a subsurface archeological feature, or a mixture of both. Other anomalies were also noted. In addition, metal detecting <clears throat> was undertaken. Three separate surveys were done uh, in the area of the Copeland marker. Uh, An historic musket ball, two historic buckshot, one historic lead uh, bullet, one button cover shown here with an anchor and rope design, um, along with um, some other pieces of metal. 
uh, were recovered in the vicinity of the Copeland marker. All promising, right? You're getting excited. These results continued to support the concrete marker's potential accuracy. So this uh, gives you an idea, maybe more of a bird's eye view. Uh, here we've got um, Copeland's marker. This indicated here we've got a little white tent over here. But we put, we put units near to the marker and then a little bit further away. This area to uh, that location is, uh, I believe, actually to the east. What's important to note is the, uh, that cover, that button cover and pieces of metal. They were recovered from this part of the pasture. So what I was talking about, those drainage, we had, um, this is actually a little road next to the fence, but these are little canals that are helping uh, drain the land. Okay, and the land has been graded, so you know it's been flattened, and we, there are push piles. The push piles are actually where you see vegetation that look like trees or bushes. Uh, a lot of them had little push piles where dirt had been pushed. So uh, we we've done the, this. Uh, 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 ground penetrating radar, we've done some GIS analysis uh, uh, and some metal detecting. Uh, based on that, we, we put in these six units uh, to investigate um, uh, GPR anomalies that we found, ground penetrating radar, and the area around the concrete marker. Uh, highly corroded ferrous metal fragments, charcoal fragments, two cut nails, and a buckshot ball were recovered from the unit placed to the northeast of the marker. More metal fragments, buckshot, a possible rivet, and a badly corroded container along with charcoal fragments were recovered to the southwest of the marker. The unit placed to explore the circular anomaly that was discovered, that was in this location where the third one was, um, revealed a dark gray linear east-west aligned anomaly that appears to be associated with agricultural activities. And the remaining two units similarly contained uh, gray linear uh, east-west aligned anomalies that appear to be associated with uh, agricultural activities. A total of three shovel tests were dug in near, nearby push-up piles that were over here and then also over here. A significant amount of, of historic artifacts were recovered in these tests, including glass, ceramic fragments, and metal fragments, all dating from the late 19th, uh, early 20th century, and likely associated with historic seminal camps uh, that were known to have been at this location known as Fort Shackelford. Um, so these are uh, a few um, uh, pictures from the field school showing the students uh, at, at work. And uh, it was an interesting collaborative between Florida Gulf Coast University and the Seminole Tribe of Florida's Tribal Historic Preservation Office. You can see, again, it's just all flattened out, so there's not much to look at. We dug very, very small levels. It was very, very, very tight as far as recovery. Uh, we didn't want to miss anything as we excavated. There is one of the cut nails along with an x-ray um, showing that that's a square nail. There's unit two. So again, you can see the marker in the background here. So we're still, we're still close. There's a unit right back here behind this young lady here. And then this is the next closest one. Lead shot. Um, lead shot came from that unit that I just showed you. And it, you know, this is a possible firing uh, mechanism for, for one of these lead shot. This was a mystery metal container. This is a, a Tupperware container that's holding sand, and in it we have this metal container. Go to the next. And um, we took some x-rays of it in order to get a better feeling. You can kind of see this outline of a container. And uh, we're not sure what if, if, it, if it was a food container. Possibly this would have been like a really early food container. Uh, they're, they're working on the circular anomaly, which didn't reveal t itself to be anything specific. You know, four, as you can see, we're not, we're not seeing a lot. They're, they're hitting limestone here, this bedrock. You can see they're not very far down at all. That kind of reveals to us that that, that bedrock's probably not too far down at, in any of these units. And uh, these ladies are hard at work also. Again, you're not seeing a lot, but uh, I tell you what, we tried to work with what we got. So results, that we have 260 uh, total artifacts were recovered during the season. And I've got highlighted here 
Um, surface collection, 31 un unidentified metal, um, 29 from shovel tests, 160 um, from test units. It's um, clearly our highest number. Um, these others are coming from shovel tests um, in those push piles, um, but unidentified metal being uh, the biggest category. So non-diagnostic metal fragments, that's what archaeologists would call this. There was nothing that would definitely point uh, to our having found the location of Fort Shackelford, although one metal artifact in particular initially appeared to have a clear connection to military activity. This button cover, okay, that was found during the metal, the preliminary metal detecting survey, the button was of interest since the U.S. Navy was involved in the Second Seminole War actions that took place in the Everglades because they were like, Everglades, wet, we need the Navy, okay? So they pulled the Navy in. I'm sure the, the sailors are really happy about that. So, um, so we thought, hey, this, this could be a clear connection. And we're, we're very excited about this. Um, it was of interest because of that. And early on, we believed that the location may, in fact, reveal itself as the site of the fort. Research into historical military buttons revealed similar designs, but none seemed to match the distinctive and clear design from this item. Vertical fouled anchor designs, like the one found here, are somewhat common in Navy junior officer buttons, but the design present on this button cover is different from these, the genuine designs in that it lacks a border and also has diagonal stippling um, in the field. So it's got this here in the background, which I didn't see on anything. Historical examples resembling our artifact include a fouled vertical anchor with a border and horizontal striping. Um, ultimately, there were no matches to the design of this button piece to actual historical uh, military buttons. The possibility of the button fragment being from a modern era button has been confirmed by experts familiar with material culture from the Seminole Wars and military accoutrements. So these are archaeologists who spend a lot of time looking at actual military buttons and other things. Um, and trust me, you know, if, if a military group has been in an area, they, even if they're there for only overnight, they leave a lot of stuff. They drop a lot of stuff and they just don't bother picking it up because they can get another one from Uncle Sam. So they don't pick up a lot of that stuff. They leave it behind, okay? Um, so uh, uh, one of the people that I contacted was Gary Ellis, and, and he noted that um, on its face it most closely resembles a style popular in the 1950s and 60s for pseudo and mod style Navy jackets. Anybody remember those? Uh, the buttons were foreign made with pot metal cores and cheap stamped iron sheet metal outers. Um, I also contacted Dr. Jonathan Leader. He agreed with um, Gary Ellis's suspicions that it's modern and pointed to the composition of nearly 100% lead as similar to that of tire balancing weights. Uh, Ellis also noted that the field of dappling or dimpling is uncommon for military designs as he believes it would be too hard to polish an iron. Um, further supporting the conclusion that this item is from the modern era. But there was more information to be mined from this artifact. They came from the community. Moses Jumper Jr., current manager of the pastures under investigation, shared crucial information that yielded a likely expl explanation for this artifact. His father, Moses Jumper Sr., managed the property from 1963 to 1993 and was known to have owned and worn replica uniform jackets. <laughs> we eventually concluded that this button pe uh, piece belonged to a replica pea jacket, a common fashion in the 1950s and 60s, possibly belonging to Moses Jumper Sr. Without this valuable community information and participation, our conclusions would not have been so clear, nor would we have ever been able to potentially connect this unique artifact to an actual person. Community insights drove our conclu conclusions forward significantly, and while we still believed that non-diagnostic metal artifacts may have come from the fort, we found there was more to learn from the community. Additional lines of information from the community em emerged during the following 
uh, and during and following the field school, which suggests we may not have been exactly where we originally believed at the precise site of Fort Shackelford. Only through the participation of tribal members were we able to gain a deeper understanding of our results and the meaning of those results within a physical and cultural landscape. In building a framework for traditional archaeological research, we did not know in what way community involvement would impact our efforts and conclusions about what we discovered. The information provided by Moses, Moses Jumper Jr. about the fouled anchor button cover potentially links the artifact with a specific tribal member, his father, Moses Jumper Sr. We did not have the knowledge to be able to, to make that connection, and without the community out input, that connection would likely have been lost entirely. But perhaps the most compelling and illuminating information provided by the community arises from Josie Billy's cautionary tale, a wariness of outsiders has led to a campaign of disinformation that confuses rather than reveals the knowledge being sought by outsiders. And speaking with Councilman Manuel Tiger about Fort Shackelford, he also indicated that following Josie Billy's incident with the archeologists in the 1930s, tribal members moved Con Copeland's concrete marker away from the actual site of Fort Shackelford. <laughs> <laughs> the monument was not destroyed uh, as he explained, because it's important to retain the memory of the campaign or battle that took place there and at which the Seminole prevailed. But by moving it away from the original location, the risk of disturbance by outsiders was reduced. This community knowledge is priceless in better understanding our results. With no diagnostic artifacts to absolutely confirm that the concrete marker does denote the location of Fort Shackelford, further investigations are required to understand the location of the marker in relationship to uh, more certain evidence of the fort. As a result of this information, we began to view the location of the concrete marker with more caution. The efforts of the community to obscure the location of the fort to prying outside eyes may come directly as a result of the deception experienced by Josie Billy and his cautionary tale. As we worked to write up our field school and a draft report on our results and conclusions, we thought we had all the information possible on the fort's location. And we shared our thoughts with community members <clears throat> who had still more to add to this story. One report from the community involved metal detectorists visiting the Fort Shackelford site on the Big Cypress Reservation. The account is that the Seminole Tribe of Florida was once asked in the 1970s by metal detector enthusiasts to go to the Fort Shackelford site and search for historic metal artifacts. In order that their efforts might be fruitful, tribal members scattered various metal fragments in an area they identified to the metal detectorist group as Fort Shackelford. <laughs> in the archaeological field, this is referred to as salting the site. Uh, in, investigators are unaware of the intentional uh, addition of materials to a site and frequently mistake them as genuine and originating from the activities under investigation. For us, it, prevented, it, it presented another fly in the ointment as far as interpreting the materials it recovered. Questions arose then about whether or not the precise location of the fort was used during this metal detecting party. Uh, were some or all of the metal fragments found during archaeological fieldwork part of the remnant materials left behind after that metal detectoring event? Uh, were these metal fragments added to the landscape another effort to protect an important cultural site from interfering outside eyes? Our eyes open to the possibility that all or some of the materials collected during our archaeological field school <clears throat> were likely the result of this salting event rather than actual military activity. This may be another chapter in Josie Billy's cautionary tale. <clears throat> Did we find the site? Hmm. Knowing about this past event uh, with archeologists uh, who betrayed this important tribal member, Josie Billy, also helps explain a related story of community efforts to hamper unwanted archeological investigations. The first tribal historic preservation officer, Mr. William Steele, reportedly attempted to undertake archaeological field work only to find his shovels missing from his field vehicle. <laughs> no other equipment was disturbed. 
by taking his shovels, they were able to hinder his digging without disturbing anything else. Archaeology is a science that handles materials that, that once belonged to those who have gone before, an area traditionally left untouched by the Seminole people. And the betrayal of Josie Billy continues to serve as a cautionary tale about protecting Seminole culture, but also about archaeologists. More history of the concrete marker. I think I've covered that. This is a uh, the metal detecting event. Sorry, I didn't bring that up now. <laughs> Related events are even clearer. Um, and I think the next here we go. The seminal history remains a truly seminal story. Um, I'm here at my conclusions now. Uh, community participation has been vital to understanding the role of Fort Shackelford in the community as well as the landscape where it was positioned. Josie Billy's cautionary tale about protecting culture for future generations can be seen weaving throughout the various histories associated with Fort Shackelford. There is also no doubt <clears throat> that the establishment of collaborative relationships and the fundamental commitment <clears throat> to an indigenous perspective were extremely important outcomes of the archaeological field school. Tribal members were able to either visit the site or to watch um, uh, there were two video broadcasts as excavations got underway. The first, Fort Shackelford, a learning journey with the, the Tribal Historic Preservation Office Field School on Big Cypress, was shot prior to the beginning of field work as students were arriving and setting up camp. The second, Fort Shackelford, rediscovered, followed a documentary style format at the site, highlighting the excavations with some interpretive content placing the evidence in the context of the history of the, of the Big Cypress Reservation. So part of what we were trying to do was share the story of what we were doing with the field school with the tribal members as we went along during the field school. Students were able to critically examine the concept of tribal archaeology and to assess its application in relation to academic and cultural resource management models typically taught in the classroom. This exercise was powerfully reinforced by the context of working and living with the local community. An additional and unanticipated consequence of the project was the self-reflective outcome for the staff of the Tribal Historic Preservation Office. The office is a young organization with no institutional memory of running a major field campaign. So the ability to explore various functions of the office during an afternoon symposium allowed staff to critically reflect on the core concepts and workflows which they had been working so hard to create. <clears throat> The outcomes of this process were consistently positive, formalizing relationships and facilitating contemplation by both staff and students of the broader context of historic preservation and the role of indigenous perspectives in current archaeological practice. The knowledge shared by the tribal community added great, great depth of understanding to this project and to the role of the community in protecting important cultural resources. Looking for the precise location of Fort Shackelford continues to be an interest to the Tribal Historic Preservation Office. As historic maps <clears throat> and documents are discovered by staff, they are studied and analyzed for any clues that may emerge concerning the location of the still elusive fort. Plans for returning to the field <clears throat> to expand archaeological investigations remain on the table for consideration. Meanwhile, the tribal community shares an interest in the location of the fort and activities associated with it. In our efforts to confirm the site under an investigation as that of Fort Shackelford, we discovered a deeper understanding of the fort that, it, that revealed it as more than a location. It's a process, it's a dialogue, it's a journey, and it's one that is not ended, and one whose importance is not so much in the destination, but in the histories learned along the way the building of relationships between researchers and the community and understanding new ways of exploring historic events and their impacts on the affected communities. Locations of cultural significance to the Seminole Tribe of Florida, including Fort Shackelford, have for many generations been recognized as places to be guarded from outsiders. By protecting these sites, the community can hold on to their culture so the tribe can flourish for years to come. In our interactions with the Seminole community, <clears throat> we discovered they have been active in protecting their own past and their culture so that the tribe may continue to thrive.
Thank you.